In this roundup, we'll talk about a new trend in monetizing music, private equity IPOs, Canadian oil sands, Kazakh protests, and a hopeful and healthful message. These are all based on interesting write-ups from the internet which are worth your time, and they are linked in the description below. So without much further ado, let's get on with it. A recent interesting development is that big-name investors are getting into music rights ownership in a big way. While there was always money to be made in music, it used to be more of a lottery than an investable asset class. Streaming may have helped change that, and as a result, we have the likes of PIMCO, KKR, and Shamrock putting serious money into buying rights to songs and music, especially those of established artists. In some ways, listening to music is more like reading a book than watching a video. The gratification may be a tiny bit delayed, and sometimes, you are not even sure about it. Perhaps because of that, it is mildly surprising that Spotify could not do for music and songs, what YouTube did for video, which is to enable small independent creators to make a living. Music still requires a lot of money for marketing and distribution but Spotify sure did enable investors to make better and more steady returns out of music as an asset class. The usual way that private equity firms earn their keep is that they'll charge a 2% management fee, which is a low-ish steady-state retainer for doing what they do. In addition, they'll also charge a 20% performance fee out of whatever profits they are able to generate from the investments. The management fee is steady and depends on how much money they are being given to manage. The performance fee is lumpy and uncertain because profits from the investments are infrequent and risky. Going public is a new way to unlock value for owners of private equity firms. Historically, PE firms were small organizations and their owners and founders were pretty hands-on. However, as the firms have grown, and the founders have moved further away from managing deals and towards managing people, more interesting ways of monetizing their efforts have opened up to them. One of the more recently favored ones is the IPO. In some ways, it is a strange thing to do for a private equity firm. A key reason for traditional companies to do an IPO is to get funds for the business, maybe for building that factory or paying off some high-cost debt. A private equity firm, on the other hand, is in the business of renting money from investors and then investing that money. They don't usually require big factories or lots of inventory to do their work. Maybe some computers with spreadsheet software, an internet connection, a telephone, and those sorts of things. Those 50th floor offices are more vanity than necessity. All that is to say that an IPO is a luxury vanity project, rather than a real necessity for a private equity firm. It is another way for the owner-managers of the fund to get richer, and maybe save some tax while doing so. The other interesting thing to notice in this write-up, is that the PE firms chose to monetize their management fee, over the performance fee. Remember, those are the only two revenue streams available to the firm. The former is a steady stream of income, which is more likely to be valued appropriately by the public markets. This story is interesting, because it tells us about the difficulties with ESG investing, especially when it comes to actually making a noticeable impact. Recently, international financiers and oil companies are moving away from Canadian oil sands, while local companies and private equity are moving in. One way to look at this transition is that the international oil majors have already made their money here. They have invested and extracted good returns from those investments. And what is left now is not worth the effort and hassle. Hence, they are moving on. Probably this is a way to do things in the oil business. As the return profile changes so do the operators and the financiers. This story is fairly similar to another recent one, where the mining company, Vale, when selling its coal mine in Mozambique, primarily due to environmental priorities, received unexpectedly keen interest from smaller private equity players. 
they eventually sold it to Jindal of India, an integrated steel producer, which was an expected move. That's all good and fine, but what about the climate, you ask? Clearly that is a harder question to answer, because the international oil companies moving out of Canadian oil sands, is not going to bring down the extraction of oil here. Could it make things worse? That too is hard to say. In today's world, it is not really a surprise that America is where the most amount of Bitcoin mining happens. What is a surprise, is that Kazakhstan is second on that list. And one of the fallouts of the recent turmoil in the country, is that the price of Bitcoin went haywire for a few days, when internet access was severely restricted there. That restriction came about, because the Kazakh government wanted to de-escalate recent public protests across the country, which were triggered by an increase in gas prices, but mostly because the disenfranchised people are unhappy with their government. This write-up mentions some interesting details about the wealth of the country's ruling elite, the vastness of that wealth, and the usual places where it is stowed away, like Geneva in Switzerland, and London in the UK. But that is not a shocker really. Ruling a country, rich in natural resources, like uranium, and fossil fuels, can be a profitable enterprise. Especially if there is no democratic process. It is a bit of a surprise though that Kazakhstan, is the better governed of the other Central Asian, stands, which may speak to the level of governance in that region. One aspect that is alluded to, but not really explored in another write-up, this time by the FT, is the importance of Western governments and companies in the story. Surely all the multiple billions that the ruling elite stowed away, came from somewhere. Usually the way it works for resource-rich countries is that there are global buyers for all those natural resources. For example, Kazakhstan is the largest producer of uranium, supplying over 40% of the world's requirement. It also has the 12th largest oil reserves, along with a lot of other metals. Not all of those resources are consumed by people of Kazakhstan. In fact, the large majority is bought by companies of other countries, which may include Western Europe and the United States. But companies are not here to pass judgment on the politics of a country. They are here to make money for their shareholders. This write-up is a hopeful message, that moderate physical activity of 30 minutes a day, goes a long way towards better mental and physical health. We are told about a study, where researchers in Sweden kept track of close to 200,000 physically active individuals over many years. When compared with those who were more sedentary, the former did really well with their physical and mental well-being. So being active in your life is beneficial for health. That is a good, wholesome message, which I endorse entirely. A couple of quick interesting observations. First, Notice that we don't really know why physical activity is supposed to work. Just that it does. There is some speculation that it brings down inflammation in the body and the brain. Which may be another way of saying that we don't really know. Second, there are over 200,000 people doing long distance skiing in Sweden. That is a lot of people, but also, how cool is that? Third, the study found that women who did well in that skiing competition, did not do so well with their mental health in the long run. What's up with competitive women? Is that an artifact of the study design, or is it something significant? Who knows, but it's an interesting article, and entirely worth your time. So that's it for this one. Thank you for sticking around and watching the entire video. If you enjoyed it, consider subscribing as it helps out the channel a lot. Ok I'll see you in the next one.